There's a new me coming out, and I just have to live, and I wanna give. I'm completely positive. I think this time around, I am gonna do it like you never knew it. Oh, I'll make it through. The time has come for me to break out of the shell. I have to shout that I am coming out. Welcome to the show, Never Too Late Ever where we focus on making the next chapter of your life the very best chapter. I am your host, Lorraine Hoving from It's About Time, and so glad you are joining us today. This day will change your life. Open your heart, your ears, and listen. You will find a gem or a treasure that you can apply to your life today. And today is an amazing day because... It is the beginning of the year, and so I thought that I would share with you, (laughs) I am the host and I am also the guest, (laughs) so I thought today I would share a little bit more about my story. I've shared it before, but I'd like to share um, my story from like a five-minute little talk that I give at times, and then I want to share with you parts of a course, an online course that I put together on things, um, on different little steps that I took to improve my life as I aged from 50 on, especially from 60 on. I am, I'm now, I'm trying to think, I think I'm 66 this year. Uh, isn't it funny when we get older, sometimes we have, to, we have to remind ourselves how old we are because the years go by so quickly. Um, but I believe I'm 66 and uh, next year I'm going to be 67. Amazing, amazing. And I am not sad about it because every day, I wake up and I say, this day, I'm going to improve. I'm going to to, um, be kinder, be more positive. And so today, I'd like to share a little bit about where I came from. So first, I'm going to start with my little talk that I often give. I danced around the living room in my green chiffon dress. I was doing twirlies. I loved to do twirlies when I was younger. And my green chiffon dress, you know, it just kind of blew out like a balloon and I loved it. I was doing somersaults. I was pretending I was a princess. I was a very, very happy child. In fact, my mother said that when I was born, I was different. She had uh, seven babies in the end, but I was a little different. When she put me down, I'd be in the crib and I would just laugh and smile and entertain myself. And I was, I remember being that child. Suddenly, the doorbell rang and I loved having company. I screamed at the top of my lungs, I'll get it. I will never forget the glass doorknob. It is etched in my mind forever. I opened the door and looked up and to see a police officer and a priest. Instinctively at 11 years old, I knew my life was going to change forever. My precious daddy, had been tragically killed in a horrific logging accident. Let me tell you about my daddy. I adored my daddy. Like I woke up and I could hardly wait to see daddy. I would sit on his lap in the morning and comb his hair and get his hair ready for, (laughs) get, get him ready for work. And he adored me because I think it's like the only way I can explain it is we spoke the same language. We loved to laugh. We were positive. We saw the world in the same way. We were easygoing and we loved people. And so I adored my dad. He was like my best 
buddy. I woke up thinking about him and I went to bed only when I had shared a bowl of ice cream with my daddy. So I'd sit with daddy every night and he used to call it warm, I don't know why, but wearing out the ice cream. So we, we both would stir our ice cream till it was almost like a thick soup. And then we would eat it every single night. So on that day, when I saw the priest and I saw the policeman, I believe that was the day my little girl not died, but she went away for time. You see, at 11 years old, I didn't understand. In fact, there were times I literally blamed myself for my daddy dying. Now that might not make sense, but somehow I thought, did I not hug him enough? Did I not love him enough? Why is he not coming back forever? And I think when you lose somebody um, suddenly, it's like a, it's, it's like you're being hit over the head with a big, huge board. You don't even know where you are. You are in shock. And that's how I felt when my daddy died. How could that be that he would never, ever come home again? From that day, my older brother began to unleash verbal attacks on me. And I believe that my brother, um, he has a, a great heart. He is now in heaven, but he, has a, he had a, a great heart. But I believe when he was younger, he possibly could have been a little jealous of my relationship with dad. So he felt like it was necessary to put me in line. And my brother was the biggest, hugest tease, and I called it verbally abusing me. He chased me with snakes, and he made fun of every single move I made. So I began to hide. You can understand when I felt this environment was with my daddy was love and kindness and warm and positivity, and suddenly my world was shut down. I no longer had my dad, and my brother began to tease me. He used to call me Fatty, fatty, two by four, can't get through the bathroom pool door. And as a child, I remember looking at the door because we had rather a narrow bathroom door. And I'm thinking, what if, what if someday I cannot get through the bathroom door? So from that point on, I believe, and I have traced it back to that, almost that very period of time when I began to have a problem with food. Food became my comfort. Food was a way to hide. It was a way to, um, I'm trying to think, to soften the blows of what life was, what I felt like life, how life was treating me at that point. So it softened the blow and I began to hide and eat in secret. And I believe you're as only as sick as your secrets. So I began to have secrets. I would, like I said, with my daddy, share an ice cream, a bowl of ice cream, worn out every single night. And now he is suddenly not there. So I would sneak a bowl of ice cream in the little Mel, I think they were Melmat turquoise bowls. I remember them distinctly. I would sneak them downstairs and eat late at night. But I had to sneak because if my brother dared to find out, he would scream it to the whole world. He literally sometimes screamed things outside in the yard at me so the whole world could hear. And I felt, felt shame. So I began to take it down late at night, and I was missing my daddy so much. And there began my secret obsession of numbing, numbing the pain with food. I remember too, having to wake up in the morning and think, oh my gosh, I put the bowl under my bed at night. And then I'd sneak up and I'd listen to see if my brother was listening. And I'd sneak up and go upstairs and wash the bowl quickly before anybody found me. 
that was my secret. I eventually, eventually reached a high weight of 275 pounds on a little petite frame of five foot one. I'm very tiny boned and my goal weight would be somewhere around 110. Still haven't made it, but I'm going to in 2021. <laughs> Fast forward, when I woke up on my 60th birthday in a pool of tears, I realized, as we all do, if I would live to be 90, and heck, I was not going to get that far. There was no way I was going to live to be that at 275 pounds. If I did, two thirds of my life was over. What a sobering thought. And for you out there, as you know, as we age, we realize that more of life is behind us than ahead of us. And it is a sobering thought. But in that sobering thought, take it to the next level and learn to make every single day count and not waste time like we did. I waste, wasted so much time in my life. If only I could have that back, but I can't, but I can have the future. So on that day, I promise, oh, and guess what? In, in all of this, I, thinking of New Year's right now, 40 years I had promised my husband that I would lose, when I first married him, I was only 15 pounds overweight. And then I got to be 140 pounds overweight, even more than that. I had promised him every year and every New Year's, New Year's I would make another promise. 40 years of New Year's resolutions lay there in a heap pile of empty promises. I said to myself, Lorraine, what are you going to do about this? Enough is enough. I had to take full responsibility for myself. I could no longer blame my past, my bully brother, or even my jeans. Heck, I couldn't even fit into my jeans. I looked at myself, and this is being really raw, <laughs> and it is raw. I looked at myself one day, naked in the mirror, because what we do, I want to, I want you to hear this. What we do is we pretend that things aren't as bad as they are, or things don't exist or don't affect, and we put them under the carpet as if they don't exist, and then we trip, and we fall, and we pretend. Are you out there pretending that things don't matter? I knew my weight mattered that day, and I looked at myself naked in the mirror, and it was not a pretty sight and it almost brings me to tears. And I said, Lorraine, you are morbidly obese. What are you going to do about it? And I remember just before I went, went naked, I had gone into my office late at night and I'd always wanted to find out if I was morbidly obese. I, I even hate the word morbidly, but I wanted to find out. So I, I don't know why I stuck into my office, but I Googled it and I found out I was morbidly obese, that horrible word, morbidly. And that's the day that I went home and looked at myself naked in the mirror and said, what are you going to do about this? This is you. There's no hiding. There's no putting something so obviously under the carpet because you've tripped over it all your entire life. You cannot fix, listen to this, you cannot fix what you won't admit. If you don't admit you have a problem, 